This program is brought to you by RTS on iTunes U from the Distance Education Department of Reformed Theological Seminary. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920. There are some other things here in your outline, uh, his view of Revelation, uh, Predictably, a revelation is not communication of information by the word, but an event that places me in a new situation. Remember Bart saying that revelation is salvation, and salvation is revelation. Same thing for Boltmann here, uh, but rather somewhat different uh, concept of it. Uh, the importance of revelation is not its content, but the fact that God speaks it. It's always an event in the present. It's the presence of God himself creating in the hearer a new self-understanding, uh, creating in the hearer authentic existence. Boltmann also makes a sharp distinction between history and Geschichte. And, uh, but of course, he's much more skeptical uh, about uh, biblical history than, than uh, Bart is. Okay, Paul Tillich. You see his dates there, died in 1965. His background, very close to Boltmann. Boltmann was one of Tillich's teachers, by the way. He speaks at one point of my very great teacher, uh, Rudolf Boltmann. And uh, Tillich agrees with Boltmann, so uh, on, on most everything, Boltmann, of course, is a biblical scholar, and Tillich is more of a philosophical theologian, so they cover different territories, but uh, for the most part they agree with one another. Boltmann, of course, very, very uh, negative, very skeptical about uh, biblical history. Uh, Tillich uh, follows Boltmann in that respect, also very skeptical about biblical uh, history. Um, he uh, left uh, Europe. He taught in Germany for some time, but he left uh, in the 30s uh, when uh, uh, Hitler came to power, and uh, he came to the United States, taught uh, at uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York for some years, and then went on to uh, teach at Harvard University uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, <clears throat> he wrote works in Germany uh, in German, some of which have not been translated. He, he, his main uh, writings, though, are in English. I don't know whether he wrote them in English or whether he got them translated before they were published, but uh, anyway, he wrote a great many uh, articles and books uh, in English, which are very well uh, known, uh, particularly his Systematic Theology, which is uh, five, uh, which is three volumes, but uh, actually in five parts, and I'll try to explain that to you in a little bit. Uh, theology on page 120, he says there are two formal criteria for theology. First, the object of theology is what concerns us ultimately. Only those propositions are theological which deal with their object insofar as it can become a matter of ultimate concern for us. That's uh, important for Tillich, a subjective criterion. Uh, theological statements are statements which we ultimately care about. We care about them more than any, anything else. Uh, and that goes with uh, Tillich's definition of faith, too. Uh, for Tillich, faith is ultimate concern. Uh, so to have faith is to uh, have faith in God, is to say that God is my ultimate concern, the thing, the thing that's most important to me, the thing that I'm going to uh, live my life for. Uh, to define ultimate concern, uh, statement B, our ultimate concern is that which determines our being or non-being. Only those statements are theological, which deal with their object insofar as it can become a matter of being or non-being for us. 
So this ties in with existentialism a little bit that says uh, uh, the, the issue in human life is death. Uh, the issue of uh, human life is being or non-being, life or death for us. And uh, Tillich says that's what theology is all about. Theology is about uh, uh, what is a matter of life or death, what is a matter of being or non-being, what is a ma- the most important thing that uh, uh, we can uh, be concerned about. Uh, well, he uh, distinguishes uh, theology from philosophy and talks about the sources of theology and the m- material norm, the rationality of theology. Uh, number six is one thing that uh, Tillich is famous for. It's called the method of correlation. Uh, Tillich says that theology makes an analysis of the human situation out of which the existential questions arise, that is, the questions of life and death. And it demonstrates that the symbols used in the Christian message are the answers to those questions. It's interesting. Symbols are the answers. He doesn't say that the the Bible gives uh, answers in the form of statements. The Bible gives answers in the form of symbols, and usually we don't think of symbols as answering anything. Uh, if you're going to answer a question, you have to give me a statement. But uh, uh, for, for Tillich, it's the symbols that give the answer to the uh, questions that uh, come out of uh, our existential situation. Uh, there is a mutual dependence between the question and the answer. The answer cannot be derived from the question. Uh, the, the answer comes from revelation. But... Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the, uh, in form, the answer is dependent upon the structure of the question. Tillich opposes uh, inadequate methods of theology. First, the supranaturalistic. Now, he's always talking about this. This is the way he talks about fundamentalism or orthodox theology or evangelicalism, uh, anything that, uh, any kind of traditional uh, Christian orthodoxy, he describes it as supranaturalistic. Now, usually when he talks about these, he caricatures them, and this is what I think he does here. He says that supranaturalistic method, that is the method of orthodoxy, takes Christianity to be a sum of revealed truths fallen from heaven like strange bodies from a strange world. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that's true of most uh, evangelicalism. I don't think that's true with the Reformed theology as we teach it here at RTS. But this is the way it looked to uh, Tillich, okay? Uh, so that's the supranaturalistic uh, method. Then there's the naturalistic method, which derives the Christian message from man's questions. That would be like uh, uh, saying, well, for, forget about the gospel, let's follow Heidegger, <laughs> okay? Um, And then there's the dualistic approach, which he identifies with Roman Catholicism, uh, which builds a supernatural structure upon a natural substructure. So uh, uh, the questions come from Aristotle, and then then there's a supplement that comes from Roman Catholic theology. Now, there there are five parts to uh, Tillich's systematic theology. And each part starts with an existential question and gives an answer from the Christian symbols. So uh, part one is reason and revelation. Uh, The question is, uh, uh, how is reason to function? Uh, What are the limitations of reason? What are the powers of reason? Uh, What can we know by reason? What can't we know by reason? Uh, these are uh, uh, the existential questions. The uh, symbol from the Christian faith that gives the answer is revelation, okay? Uh, not the doctrine of revelation, uh, but, the, but the symbol of revelation, which gives Tillich a lot of wiggle room there, <laughs> okay? So reason and revelation. Uh, the, the second part is... Uh, uh, Being and God, okay? Being is the question, God is the answer. Uh, The third part 
existence. And again, keep in mind how the term existence is used in existentialism. Uh, part three, uh, existence and the Christ. Uh, part four, life and the spirit. And part five, history and the kingdom of God. So it's really kind of a traditional scheme of organization. It's Trinitarian. Before the Trinity, in a pre prefatory way, there's a discussion of Revelation. Uh, but then you have a section on God, a section on Christ, a section on uh, the Holy Spirit, and then a section on uh, eschatology, the last things, the kingdom of God, the, where is history going, all of that kind of question. So that's the structure of Tillich's uh, systematic theology. I'll take you through a little bit of this. Uh, uh, if you look at page 121, section C, uh, this is uh, uh, reason and revelation. And he starts off by talking about the structure of reason. He distinguishes between ontological reason and technical reason, subjective reason, the depth of reason. <laughs> uh, the, the depth is a very important concept in Tillich. Uh, the, uh, it, it, it's sort of like, uh, uh, you, you know, when you're working on a problem, you might find a superficial answer here, a, super, a superficial answer there, but you're not satisfied, and you keep working on it, and you keep studying. And, and then suddenly the light dawns, the penny drops, as they say, and, uh, and you say, man, now I've got it. Now I understand. Now I know. And that, that, that doesn't happen very often, but that happens occasionally as you study things and you, you work on problems and difficulties. And every now and then you say, I've, I've, I've really got something significant here. And that, I think, is what Tillich talks about uh, when he speaks about the depth of uh, reason, the depth of uh, knowledge. Um, and uh, that when you get to the depth of things, uh, that's when you're, you're getting to God, okay? God is the depth. He's being itself. He's the ground and the abyss. He's the great mystery. He's truth itself, being itself, justice itself. Um, and, and when you, you know, you may be talking about justice. Okay, this is just, this is unjust, uh, this is more just than that, uh, so on and so forth. But every now and then, you'll, you'll see an example, you'll see a, a treatise, and you'll say, man, you nailed it. Uh, that, that really is justice. That, that's justice as justice ought to be. Um, so uh, the structure of reason. Uh, and then he talks about reason as fallen, and uh, page 122, the nature of knowledge. And then the nature of revelation, he distinguishes between uh, revelation as a miracle, and he has his own definition of that. It's not uh, uh, what you might expect, uh, but revelation is mystery, it's ecstasy, and it's miracle. So often uh, Tillich divides uh, his categories into threes, kind of like, uh, like Hegel. Uh, and uh, then the media of revelation, knowledge of revelation, final revelation. Now, wh what is a final revelation? This is kind of the depth of it all. This is when we say, man, now, I, now I'm really in touch with God. God has really revealed himself to me. And uh, what is that final revelation? The final revelation is a re revelation that is united to the ground of being without separation, uh, without disruption, and therefore transparent to the mystery. Remember, God is the ground of being. Uh, therefore, revelation, this final revelation, uh, can negate himself without losing himself. Um, 
Every medium of revelation occurs in a finite situation. It must negate its finite aspect. In negating its finitude, it overcomes finitude. So, uh, here he set up a kind of a criterion for final revelation, the highest revelation, the ultimately satisfying revelation, the depth of revelation. And it's a revelation which... Uh, uh, is transparent to God, but it's also a revelation which is able to negate itself without losing itself. Now, most revelations, you know, they 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 fall down. I mean, at some point, uh, uh, they they have to have to admit, uh, I I am false. Uh, I am not uh, transparent to the to the ultimate, but. Uh, here we have a revelation that uh, can negate itself without losing itself. The content of this final revelation is the revelation of Jesus as the Christ. Uh, Jesus avoided all temptations to claim ultimacy. He sacrificed himself on the cross, negating himself. Therefore, he liberates us from the authority of everything finite in him, his conditioned worldview, and so on. He sacrifices what is merely Jesus uh, to uh, his uh, transparency to God. Now, I think what Tillich is saying, I mean, there's a lot of technical terminology here that I haven't given you because I don't want to take the time, but uh, Jesus is the highest revelation, the final revelation, the revelation in depth. Why? Because he, he is, uh, uh, he negates himself. Uh, remember how Hegel said that uh, the truth comes by negation and, uh, and, and, and uh, transcendence? You, you get an idea and then you negate it and you see that there's some truth in the opposite idea and that leads you to a higher idea. Uh, Jesus negates himself. Jesus says, I am the Messiah, I am the Lord, but uh, at the same time he's a man, and so he's not the Messiah, he's not the Lord. And so he has to admit that, and he, he has to take a humble role. And uh, his humility extends so far uh, to the cross. And the cross is a is a self-negation. The cross is the principle of self-negation writ large. And so Jesus, uh, uh, by dying on the cross, Jesus negates himself. And in negating himself, he shows uh, that, that God is really God and becomes the truest and the finest, final revelation. Um, so... Uh, you, you see what, what Tillich is, uh, is about here. The second part of the uh, systematic theology is called uh, Being and God. He, uh, Tillich uh, denies that God is uh, a being. Um, rather, he wants to insist that God is uh, the ground of being. And... Uh, so he, uh, and he also says that God is being itself. Now remember, Thomas Aquinas did that, uh, basing his idea on uh, Exodus 3.14. So there is some basis for this in the history of uh, theology to call God being and to identify God uh, with being. Uh, but uh, uh, Tillich uh, brings in a lot of philosophical concepts here that uh, probably have very little relationship to uh, Scripture. Uh, I would like to share this with you, number 10 on page 128. This is the God beyond God. Faith, remember, according to Tillich, is the uh, ultimate concern and God is a word that uh, can be applied to any object of ultimate concern, whether it's appropriate or not. If it's not appropriate, of course, you say that it's a false God. You say that it's an idol. Uh, 
Uh, faith in Tillich's view is inseparable from doubt. Since it seeks the depth of being, it renounces all objective certainty. Um, the uh, depth of being is something far deeper than any kind of objective certainty. So true faith, says Tillich, can be discerned in a really passionate doubt. Now you remember how Kierkegaard said that you're really not praying to God unless you're passionate about it. You're really, uh, you, may as well be pre you may as well be praying to an idol uh, if you're uh, just uh, uh, doing it for show, if you're just doing it out of tradition. Uh, but if you're to pray to the real God needs to be uh, passionate. And uh, Tillich wants to say something like that too. Uh, but he wants to say, and, and uh, he wants to say that, uh, that if you pray with really passionate doubt, that is if you're a, a, an atheist, but you really care about your atheism, and uh, you're, you're really uh, emotionally caught up in your atheism, uh, then you are ultimately concerned. And if you're ultimately concerned, you have faith. And if you're ultimately concerned, then of course, your prayer is a prayer toward a, a kind of God. So Tillich says the true faith, perhaps the most profound faith, exists as the courage to be, the courage to affirm being without seeing anything concrete which would conquer the non-being in fate and death. This is absolute faith, which says yes, even though there is no special power that conquers guilt. See, if you pray and you don't uh, believe that, there, that anybody's hearing you, but you cry out anyway, that is true faith. This faith, says Tillich, does not overcome anxiety and meaninglessness. You, we, we often say that about God. We say that God overcomes our anxiety. God overcomes our thinking that everything is meaningless and so on. Tillich says, no, it's this passion, which may uh, be a passion for atheism. Uh, this faith does not overcome anxiety and meaninglessness but it is, quote, the courage to take the anxiety of meaninglessness upon oneself. Okay, here's somebody who passionately says everything is meaningless. I don't know, maybe he uses Ecclesiastes as a proof text there. He says everything is meaningless, I'm, and, and I affirm meaninglessness. <laughs> and that is true faith, according to Tillich. The object of such faith is a God, quote, above the God of theism, who emerges, quote, when the traditional symbols have lost their power. Okay? So you, you, you don't believe anymore in, in the, the gospel, you don't believe in the Bible, you don't believe in the bread and the wine, you don't believe in and the cross, you know, even, although Tillich thinks the cross is a very powerful symbol, but say you don't even believe in that, you don't believe in any of the traditional symbols of Christ, they just have no, no uh, claim on you. But uh, there's, when you have this passionate doubt, uh, you're reaching God at a certain level. This is a God above the God of theism. Remember Nietzsche said that God is dead? A lot of people can't believe in God in the modern period. Well, when you embrace that fact, when you embrace meaninglessness, uh, you're showing the courage to be, and he says the courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when God, that is the God of the Bible, the traditional God, when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. Let me give you that again. The courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. Well, this is essentially the same concept of God that you find in Tillich's systematic theology, although in the systematic theology it's dolled up with a little bit more orthodox terminology. 
Okay, I, I, I'm going to move on from there to page 136. You see a, uh, this is called the New Hermeneutic. All right, the New Hermeneutic. These are post boltmannian thinkers. These are people who are students of Boltmann, as Tillich was also, but Tillich was much more philosophical in his orientation. The new hermeneutic people are more uh, oriented toward biblical studies as Boltmann himself was. And you see the names there, uh, uh, Gerhard Abling, Ernst Fuchs, James M. Robinson, Robert Funk, and others. Uh, this group uh, has a broader understanding of hermeneutic. Uh, hermeneutic, of course, is usually defined as interpretation. When you study hermeneutics in seminary, usually you're studying how to interpret the Bible. Uh, traditionally, hermeneutics teaches the rules and techniques for interpreting texts. And, of course, biblical texts are the most important for theology. So that's what biblical hermeneutics is. But uh, philosophy uh, has developed uh, the, the concept of hermeneutics in a somewhat different direction. Uh, Martin Heidegger, and you see how important Heidegger is to all of this, Heidegger building on some suggestions of Schleiermacher and Diltai, suggests a somewhat more comprehensive notion of hermeneutics, not only the interpretation of language, but the interpretation of reality through language. So hermeneutics is a way of interpreting the world. Hermeneutics, in this sense, is, is kind of a synonym for philosophy or kind of a synonym for epistemology, if you will. It's very broad. Uh, for one thing, language, says Heidegger, is itself interpretation. So uh, it's not just a matter of interpreting language, but it's recognizing that when people speak language, they are, they are uh, interpreting reality. Uh, and to understand language is to understand uh, reality in this way, to understand the uh, reality through language. So the goal for us is to let reality itself speak to us by means of language, and hermeneutics in the traditional sense is a means toward that larger goal. So language is rightly understood only by means, in, uh, only when by means of language there is an existential encounter between the hearer and reality. Now, the new hermeneutic thinkers are, are basing their thought on the later Heidegger rather than the early Heidegger. And if you remember from our talk about Heidegger, uh, the later Heidegger moves into a somewhat more mystical phase where he's not so much uh, concerned about interpreting the world, interpreting language, interpreting human nature, human docile, as he calls it. But in his later phase, he's more concerned about, uh, uh, about letting, getting rid of the barriers, getting rid of the uh, 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 things that obstruct uh, our vision of reality. Let reality through. Let reality speak to you. Let reality reveal itself to you. And uh, here the, the, the philosopher has a somewhat more passive stance. Uh, let the world speak to me. And uh, language then is not so much a tool that we use, but language is something we listen to. So that the, through language, the world will speak to us. Being will speak to us. So, uh, but how does that happen? Well, it happens through a kind of existential encounter between the individual and reality. So, uh, interpretation ought not to be objective and neutral. 
Uh, it's not a, a scientific kind of endeavor where you take certain rules and you apply them to, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, work of uh, getting some information, but rather it's a matter of leaving yourself open. Uh, it's almost like getting ready to listen to, to revelation. Uh, so it's not objective or neutral, you, you come to the text with a pre-understanding. That's Bultmann. Bultmann said, uh, existent, uh, Bultmann said that exegesis without presuppositions is impossible. Uh, we always bring our presuppositions. We always bring our assumptions. We always bring our baggage uh, to the text. And of course, uh, for Van Til, presupposition was Christian theism. Uh, for Rudolf Bultmann, the presupposition was uh, the modern worldview. But uh, Bultmann says, you know, just bring your, bring your pre-understanding, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what worldview you have, just bring that. and Let the, let the, the voice of being come through and, and call that, those presuppositions into question. The... Uh, uh, New Hermeneutic believes in something that they called sock critique. This is their attitude toward the Bible. Uh, Boltmann, of course, was famous for demythologization, uh, that is, uh, trying to read the Bible without myth, trying to read the Bible without these stories of supernatural intervention and so on. The uh, New hermeneutic people uh, uh, see themselves as even more radical than that. Uh, and uh, so they, they saw themselves as taking a critical approach to all the contents of Scripture, not only the mythological stories, but the theology uh, as well, the view of God and everything. Uh, and of course, they insisted that you uh, come to the Bible without any without assuming the supernatural, in fact, uh, with anti-supernatural assumptions to eliminate any kind of external grounding for faith. The uh, New Hermeneutic uh, writers talked about the so-called language event. When you're reading the Bible, uh, think of its language uh, not as propositional. I remember all these guys uh, all these theologians uh, oppose propositional revelation, you know, and uh, that's understandable because their their chief principle is uh, human intellectual autonomy. Uh, they don't want God telling us what to believe. Uh, but it's interesting, they all oppose propositional revelation. They all oppose God, the idea of God telling us what to believe, and uh, they all do it for different they reject propositional revelation for different reasons. Uh, the uh, Enlightenment rationalists, uh, frankly, say that human reason has to be the final authority, and that's incon inconsistent with propositional revelation. Now, same for Kant. Uh, Schleiermacher uh, said we can't have propositional revelation because revelation is through feelings. Uh, Ritual uh, said we can't have propositional revelation because revelation is through value judgments. Uh, Bart says we can't have propositional revelation because uh, uh, revelation is something uh, in Geschichte which uh, comes upon us and uh, uh, causes a crisis uh, to us. Uh, with uh, Bruner, you can't have propositional revelation because... Uh, uh, because uh, revelation is always personal and propositions are always impersonal. Uh, and, uh, of course, Paul Tillich, uh, uh, Rudolf Bultmann and Paul Tillich, you can't, obviously can't have propositional revelation with them. And that's uh, the same for these Bultmann disciples, which we're calling uh, uh, the new uh, hermeneutic uh, people. They... Uh, maintain then that revelation is this can't be propositional because it's this non-propositional almost mystical experience of waiting to hear what being has to say to me the language event not information but the communication of god himself 
as a person. And revelation creates a new understanding. They like to say, we don't interpret the word, the word interprets us. And, you know, there's some truth in that, but, uh, you know, in theology, uh, don't go by slogans because every slogan can have a good meaning and a bad meaning at the same time. The language event is something that happens again and again uh, as we read the Bible. Uh, it's not so much the communication of meaning as it is the communication of power. It's a transformation of life. And then in proclamation, this language event becomes the word again, uh, kind of like Karl Barth. So uh, the word... Uh, uh, opens us to new ways of thinking and opens us to to uh, consider the, the possibilities in the future. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to Moltmann. That becomes very important to uh, Moltmann. Well, these disciples of Boltmann, um, perhaps surprisingly, because they, they see themselves as very, very radical Bible critics, but uh, another part of their uh, idea is the what became called the new quest for the historical Jesus. Now the old quest was the quest of Ritchell and Hermon and Harnack uh, to seek to a, to seek a biography of Jesus through critical historical study. Uh, now, of course, they weren't going to build their theology on this. Uh, for ritual, uh, they don't build their theology on historical facts. They build their theology on value judgments that are derived from historical study. But uh, in the old quest, they wanted to have some kind of an objective uh, historical understanding of who Jesus was. And uh, the Jesus they discover becomes a kind of example to us or a kind of archetype for us. Now, the old quest was basically stymied uh, by Albert Schweitzer and Johannes Weiss, uh, who uh, basically made the, took the view that uh, historical study uh, reveals a Jesus who was an apocalyptic visionary who thought that the world was just on the brink of coming to an end uh, and uh, uh, who devised a kind of ethic for people who were only going to live a few years waiting for the kingdom. And that's the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Schweitzer and Weiss uh, said, therefore, that Jesus' teaching, Jesus' ethics, Jesus' uh, example did not have any ongoing uh, relevance for us today. Uh, that was the end of the old quest, and uh, the door was open for people like Bart and, and Bruner who uh, wanted to base their theology on something other than uh, a historical uh, understanding of the, of the historical Jesus. But now in the 50s, uh, these students of Boltmann, Abeling and Fuchs and so on, uh, want to have a new quest. And where does this come from? Well, Boltmann, you remember, uh, reduced most all of the New Testament to the category of myth, but not quite all of it. Uh, he did believe in uh, a somewhat traditional God. Okay, uh, The concept of God is not mythical, according to Boltmann. And he also believed that there was such a person there was a person named Jesus who lived about the same time that Scripture describes him as, believe, uh, as living and who had an awful big impact on uh, certain disciples of his uh, who went on and preached the existentialist gospel of Heidegger. <laughs> okay? uh, there, there, there's some, something that's important about the historical Jesus for uh, Boltmann. He believed that, that uh, Jesus lived, he believed that Jesus taught, and he believed that Jesus was crucified. He, he didn't believe in the atonement, didn't believe in the resurrection, but he believed in those things at least. He used to say, we know that 
Jesus existed. We know Das, the Das, but we don't know much about how he existed. We don't know what he was. We know the Das, but we don't know the Vas, okay? Well, uh, some of Boltmann's disciples, particularly Kaysman and Borncom, were unsatisfied with that dichotomy between the uh, that and the how. And so they, uh, they wanted to learn more about the historical Jesus. Boltmann was always talking about the kerygma, the preaching, but the preaching focused on Jesus. So what is there about Jesus that is important for uh, uh, our existentialized uh, faith? Well, and why him rather than somebody else? So uh, the new hermeneutic uh, figures uh, follow this new quest trying to find something more about the historical Jesus. Uh, how is the new quest different from the old quest? Well, the new quest is not interested in a biography of Jesus. They think that's impossible. And they reject the goal of objective historiography, which was the goal of, for example, Harnack. But the New Testament uh, seeks, they think, positively to show us how Jesus can be understood in faith. And so we come to know the historical Jesus by understanding the New Testament language event uh, in faith. That is, it's basically a theological task, not a, a technical historical task. It's a task of finding where Jesus fits in uh, in the kerygma, in the proclamation. Why is Jesus important uh, here? And uh, that's uh, known as the new quest. Now, uh, around 1970, 1980 or so, uh, people were saying that the new quest was dead. <laughs> and uh, people started talking about a third quest, and that's associated with people like uh, uh, James Dunn and, uh, and N.T. Wright and so on. You can read about that. I, I, I may say something about that later on, but uh, uh, basically I think this is a narrative that will be uh, continued in your New Testament courses but uh, anyway, just keep in mind that there are these three quests of the historical Jesus. And uh, these, these guys are struggling to find out where Jesus fits in, you know. I mean, if you've got a, a, a gospel that amounts to secular existentialism, how does that have anything to do with Jesus? Or if you've got a gospel like Tillich's that uh, is basically a philosophical system dealing with being and existence and all that, where does Jesus fit in? Uh, well, for, for Tillich, uh, Jesus was kind of a symbol, and Jesus was uh, um, uh, a symbol of self-negation. He, he, he gave his life in order to affirm his life, kind of a dialectical thing, but that, that's not very persuasive. And so uh, the, these people are really struggling. They've uh, allowed their liberal theological prejudices to take them so far that they've gotten to a point where, where there's really no more room for Jesus in Christian theology. Amazing enough, but that's, uh, that's actually what seems to have happened uh, among these thinkers. I do want to say a little bit about a really something really anomalous called Christian atheism. <laughs> This was uh, a theological movement that was famous for about 15 minutes in 1967. Uh, I joke with you, but uh, but uh, it's sort of like that almost. There was a Time magazine cover that was all black uh, and said, Is God dead? And then uh, the Time magazine story went through these uh, thinkers who were claiming to be Christians, claiming to be Christian theologians, but they, they claimed that in some sense God was dead. Um, as, I, as I say, it didn't last for very long, but it kind of shows you the extreme to which the, theology has gotten. Now, I told you that, uh, that uh, uh, for the most part, the history of, the, uh, history of liberal theology is a history of conservative drift. But we're in the middle of a glitch 
we're in the middle of an exception, a massive exception to the conservative drift. And Boltmann was a major exception to it. Uh, Tillich was a major exception to it. And then the extreme uh, of Christian atheism, people actually claiming to be atheists but claiming to be Christians at the same time. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, secular theology also as uh, this glitch in the conservative drift. After that, things start to settle down and we get more conservative-sounding theologies again. But uh, uh, understand what happens. I mean, Boltmann comes along saying, I don't believe this, I don't believe in that, I don't believe in that. Tillich says, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that. I mean, Tillich says he, he's not even sure, what, he, he doesn't want to say that God exists because, uh, and then he gives this real philosophical explanation for it. He says that uh, if I say that God exists, then that would mean his existence is estranged from his being, and that can't be true. Uh, but uh, anyway, you know, here, here are these people denying this and denying that, and it all almost seemed, uh, and wondering where Jesus fits in, you know, and uh, it almost seems like it's, it's just a matter of time before someone will say, well, Maybe God doesn't exist either. I mean, maybe the, the Bible is wrong when it says that there's a God. Um, oh, why not? I mean, Nietzsche said that God was dead. <laughs> why shouldn't we follow Nietzsche in that direction too, as, as we followed him in so many other ways? Um, uh, God is dead. Well, what's, what's that all about? As I say here in the uh, notes, uh, sort of a theological flash in the pan, but an instructive one. It does help us to see the logical implications of the earlier theology of the 20th century. The uh, transcendence imminence dialectic. Remember that? Remember the rectangular diagram where there's transcendence in the top corners and imminence in the lower corners, and then on the right-hand side of the uh, rectangle, uh, there's a, a non-Christian understanding of divine transcendence and divine imminence. Namely, God is so transcendent that we can't have anything to do with him, and God is so imminent that he can't be distinguished from the world uh, that he's made. Well, uh, both this false transcendence and this false imminence really imply atheism. If you believe that God is so transcendent that he can have no relation to us, uh, then you really, for practical purposes, have no God at all. Uh, the extreme of that transcendence principle is atheism, that uh, God is so far removed from us that uh, uh, we, we can't take account of him at all in our lives, and, and how can we even confess his existence? We, we can't, uh, because we, we say things exist only when we have some access to them, and we don't have any access to God. Or if you go the imminence route, uh, uh, you, you say, well, God doesn't exist because uh, uh, God is not distinguishable from the world, and a God who's not distinguishable from the world isn't God at all in the biblical sense. So the transcendence imminence dialectic, and we've seen that over and over again among these theologians, uh, think of uh, Barth's uh, Geschichte and History, uh, its view of transcendence relegates God to a position where he can have no intelligible relations with the universe, and the imminence pole identifies God with the universe and thus destroys his divinity. Now, this scheme fits all the theologians discussed so far, except for the pre-Kantian Orthodox and possibly Kierkegaard. Uh, and, and it's interesting that the Christian atheists we're all students of people like Boltmann and Tillich and Bart. Okay, even Bart was important to them, and they gave credit uh, to Boltmann and Tillich and Bart. Boltmann's demythologization was important. They they just decided that the, the Christian atheists decided that God was just as mythological as the angels are. Uh, Tillich's God beyond the God of theism, uh, the God who appears uh, when you have a really passionate atheist faith, uh, 
Well, that's so you can understand how Christian atheism comes out of that. You, you don't really need God. All you need is a passionate, uh, is a passionate uh, passion about being and non-being. Uh, then, uh, top of 139, um, Bonhoeffer, I'll say more about him in a little bit. Uh, Bonhoeffer, uh, in his later work, speaks of a non-religious way of uh, uh, relating to God, living in a world uh, with an unbelieving uh, population uh, uh, as if God doesn't exist, uh, living with them in order to serve them and not to try to rule over them. And then Bart, uh, Bart's God who uh, becomes his opposite, uh, his own opposite, uh, God who negates himself, um, the God whom we can't define, the God who, who, who doesn't uh, reveal himself in any uh, rational kind of way. Well, uh, and Tillich's uh, doctrine of divine self-negation. Well, the uh, Christian atheists uh, gave credit to all these people. Uh, well, there's Thomas Altizer, first of all, who was... Uh, probably the most famous, well, well, let's keep going here. Uh, Altizer's argument precisely parallels the transcendence immanence dialectic. Uh, Christian atheism also serves as a bridge to other secular theologies and theologies of liberation. We'll talk more about that uh, because it's willing to accept the authority of secular thought in a way more than the theologians we've considered up until now. Uh, but Christian atheism uh, didn't have a lasting importance. You won't find people writing today who are Christian atheists. And the lack of lasting influence, I think, is due to the conservative drift that we've seen um, in those theologies that have made the most impact. Lasting influence for a theologian, no matter how liberal he is, requires at least some lip service to a biblical and theological rhetoric, respectful handling of the full range of Christian doctrine. Now, we see that in Bart, whatever we may think of Bart, certainly he was respectful of the uh, traditional faith and of the Bible. Uh, but, uh, of course, after Bart, there's this glitch in the conservative drift. And so uh, I, I think the that people like Boltmann and Tillich and, and the new hermeneutic and the, and the Christian atheists and so on will have very little influence on theology going, going forward. Uh, just a little bit about Altizer, who, uh, who's, uh, again, quite unimportant, but I think he's sort of interesting. Altizer uh, uh, opposes the concept of God as an unchanging substance, he insists that God is able to become the opposite of himself. God is able to become other than himself. And of course, that's what Bart uh, said. Altizer also says that he believes in a fully canotic Christ. Now, canotic theology is the idea that when Jesus became incarnate, he set aside his divine attributes uh, to some extent or other. And uh, so that when he was on earth, he was not fully God. He, he was perhaps had some powers of God, but not all powers of God because he'd set aside uh, his divine attributes. Uh, now, Altizer, uh, of course, generally the church rejects this. Uh, evangelicalism rejects uh, canoticism. But uh, with Altizer, uh, Altizer embraces canoticism and he wants to take it to an extreme. He says that uh, he believes in a fully canotic Christ. That is, when God became incarnate in Christ, uh, he, that is God, even God the Father, uh, God the Father relinquished his divine attributes, experienced death, and therefore annihilated himself so that there is no God anymore. Okay? So the incarnation is an event in which God canceled himself out. Kind of similar to Paul Tillich here, but you see how it results in the death of God. There is no resurrection, there is no ascension to heaven, 
God's death is permanent. Yet, says Altizer, there's something good about this. There's a dialectic here. The, out of the negative comes something positive. Uh, God's death gives liberty to man, opening the way to uh, us to fulfill ourselves. And that is realized eschatology, he says. Um, so here in Altizer, uh, he denies tr the transcendence of God, uh, rejects the supernatural, rejects absolutes, particularism, static concepts, uh, sympathy for Oriental monism. Hamilton, uh, another Christian atheist, is uh, less interesting, I would say, than uh, Altizer. Uh, Altizer has this kind of almost Hegelian dialectic of God negating himself and so on. Uh, Hamilton is more common sense. Uh, Hamilton just says, look, modern men uh, uh, live with science and technology, um, and that development is irreversible, and human beings really today, living in the modern world, can't take the, the old concept of God seriously, and so they need to learn to live without God. Uh, yes, he says, uh, it is right to wait for God, that is, to wait for the idea of God to reappear in some other form, uh, but uh, uh, there, there's no point in uh, believing in God today. The preceding program has been brought to you by RTS on iTunes U and may not be reproduced or disseminated in part or in whole for sale or for profit without express written consent. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920.